what a treat to be here um, on this occasion. Breathing, hearing new breath into those words. So thank you for the breathing.
You do not chase a ghost by looking directly, by, but by catching his reflection in the mirror. You look behind. My father is long gone, and this year I have outlived his 55 years. In the 40 years since he left this earth, my thinking about him has grown as I have grown, leading to the mirage that his life has continued to have open-ended meaning. In my first attempts to reconstruct him, Thomas was a man of diffuse themes, bundled by character, a tumble of duets with me, constrained by the name Father. Later, Thomas became a subject, just like me, and in that regard, a human being, beset by desires, fears, and ambition, but just as furiously scrutinized as before for his flaws, that is, never fully fleshed out. As time passed, Thomas became a man in history, suspended in a frame, comparable to others, like my stepfather, who was around the same age, and like him, a black veteran shaped by the Depression and World War II. He and I were the tranquil observer types to the excited tempers in our family. There was a friction between my mother and my sister, who was timber to her silk. My mother told me that she liked men tall, dark, and handsome. I laughed, recognizing the formula from 30s movies. My father was tall, dark, and handsome, though the word tall might be disputed. He was no more than five foot ten. He was very handsome. He had a smooth, unlined face of rich, dark chocolate, a face where every feature was in balance. Almond-shaped eyes, broad nose, not too large or small, well-defined lips he often tucked inside his mouth as if holding back his words. He was trim, broad-shouldered, well-proportioned. His hands were wide and warm with smoothed calluses. He was no stranger to manual labor. Work gave fiber and form to his masculinity, what it was to be a man in the company of his family of females. He was most legible as the man who went to work every day, often leaving at dark two jobs most of the time, returning at dusk, the sun setting with him as I would sometimes see him coming behind him, both of us headed west. He'd place his duffel-shaped bag in the closet, remove his shoes, and put on his slippers before dinner. He was a man whose steady attendance at work gave him a shape to us, as if he had taken the shape of his work clothes, as if his clothes propelled him out somewhere and cloaked him with dignity. He knew the statement your shoes make about you. He kept his shoes shined and polished. He would never leave the house with them dusty. He maintained that your shoes told more about you faster than words. Only later did I realize the elaborate shoe shine kit, two colored waxes, black and brown, two brushes, one for applying, one for buffing, a toothbrush for getting at the crevices, a clear sealant to cover it all, kept in the kitchen over the broom closet was complete in a meticulous professional sense by a person who spent some portion of his working life at the feet of strangers, coaxing shine from leather. When he worked at the MTA, I sometimes expected to see him at one of the stations because, like most New Yorkers, I used the subway every day. But I never did see him. When I asked him what he did for the MTA, he told me that he cleaned and repaired track. So while I never saw him directly, I saw what he did by watching the crews. I was able to know when I saw others like him working in a five-man crew, combing the stations and tunnels all night for rubbish and gathering it up. The men traveled in dust and grime amidst a constant trash storm, bedouins of the subway tunnels. 
On summer nights when the air outside and in the station was heavy as if condensed to a solid mass, the crews worked in the accumulated heat, two in front and two in back, behind an enormous stalking diesel dumpster while the driver rode on top. The trash diesel's long body snaked through the tunnel. The men kept pace, performing their jobs with few wasted gestures in bright orange vests, occasionally gasping, an occupationally induced asthma, waiting for the appointed time to stop. And when they stopped, the tall crew might climb to the platform, sit down and drink tepid water from thermoses, or walk to the end of the platform to smoke a cigarette in the brackish but thinner ear near the exit. Sometimes it was just to put on the radio to see what was going on above ground, the earth's surface. They snatched fragments through the grates, the pattern of traffic, the summer rain pouring in spray from an opening overhead. The radio tuned in the night imperfectly, full of static and language, wrenched from the stream above, of above ground patter. And then it would be time to move again. Signaled by the clamorous wheeze of the diesel, the radio turned up louder AM this time as they dragged dumpsters back to their places on the subway platform to await another day's overfilling. The rail crew would amble back, faithful retainers to this beast, moving from lit platform back into the night tunnel, red-eyed, dispersing the rustling rats the unnamed in the shadows of his shuddering path. Once home, my father made straight for the bathroom where he would go through a bar of soap trying to remove the grime that coated him, even the places that were covered, like the soles of his feet. Out of the bathroom, he drank copious amounts of fluid, water, punch, iced teas that he made to quench his thirst, draining half the giant glass pitcher before stopping.